A quick look at Rakwai culture, which exists in the northern portion of Peru in the highlands. It rose to prominence in the intermediate period, that would be the period after the collapse of Chavin interaction spear. The Rakwai folks are contemporaries of Moche, and we're going to be talking about Moche in a second. The Moche and the Nazca. So it's about the same time frame, but with a reasonably different uh, cultural approach and certainly different artistic approach. The Rakwai culture is going to rise up in the Chavin region in pretty much the same space physically. The deal is Chavin had somehow managed to create a peace. Uh, the folks uh, in the, the first horizon, the early horizon, uh, managed to be relatively peaceful and get along with one another. And we think it was because everybody bought into uh, the basic belief system, the unifying symbols and beliefs of Chavin. When that was gone, and we suspect that Chavin itself, Chavin de Wantar, might have been the victim of an earthquake, when uh, Chavin's presence disappeared, there was a period of struggle, and it was a period of warfare. As a result of that, we get a very male-dominated society, and within a, I'm going to call it a warrior society, there tends to be a great deal of stress on prominent male individuals on their power and on their position in society. That is going to show up in this example which otherwise I think just observing it for the first time you might think well it's unusual but it's also kind of charming and that's true for quiet creations and it's tended to make them pretty popular so much so that most of the sites have been looted so every architectural form like we're looking at right now has come without a context so we do not know what its original uh, placement was probably as a tomb item, but that's all I can really tell you. Uh, this is figure 74 in our textbook, and it is a granary storehouse. It was painted with negative resist, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, more than that, I think it's actually an architectural effigy. It's a human being, literally, that merges with the house that he is a part of. So why would a granary be important? A granary, and we're identifying it as a granary based upon other buildings in the Andes which have similar shapes, including from the period of the Inca, which were used for storing excess crops. Okay, why would this be important? Because the Andes are a precarious place to live, you can have unexpected droughts, you can definitely have El Nino events, and these can threaten your survival. So it's really important that you store up foodstuffs or food supplies, and in particular grain. And that's what we think this is a representation of. Partly because, and I'm going to call these the doorways, the doorways in are up high, and that would protect them from anybody who might steal your goods, your stuff, your supplies, but also in theory it's going to protect the uh, grain from rodents that might harm or uh, actually steal your goods. Can't see it, but underneath the eaves here there were actually slits that represent the areas where we would get airflow. In other words, we're going to protect our grain also from um, anything that might corrupt it, and, and that would include mold. So we think that this is a building designed to hold grain and that represents goods and supplies. The person who has merged with it, we think, has some degree of status as the person who protects it, but also almost certainly as the person who owns and controls it. We can recognize that this is a high-status individual because of the relatively large ear spools that he's wearing. He also has a headdress, which denotes his prominence with the community. In addition to that, though, as his head merges with the body of the globular ceramic vessel, it does imply that he's a, I'm going to say, rotund fellow, and that would suggest that he's well-fed. The decoration on the exterior of the architecture also would reference the designs that you might find on the fabric of a man's tunic. And that would include, as we go right here with the projection outward, that would include the hem of the tunic and then all of this resist decoration, which can pass as building decoration, 
would also be the equivalent of the decoration that we would find on uh, Rukwai textiles as well. So the man literally is a reflection of the house. The house and the man are one, and both are shown as prominent and filled with status. Rukwai vessels tend to have two openings. Uh, one is a place where you can pour the liquid, and this probably would have been reserved for rituals or feasts for special occasions. And probably what we're pouring into this is uh, maize beer or corn beer that would have been reserved. Chicha is its name. Would have been reserved to be shared on very intimate and special occasions. I say intimate because this is a relatively small vessel. But okay, we pour it in here. So how do we get it out? Well, it comes out right here in the second opening or in the second spout. That symbolically also suggests that the man who represents the house, the building, is also the one who dispenses the corn beer to his probably relatives, to his guests, and also we suspect to his ancestors, because many of these ritual vessels might indeed have been used in ceremonies to honor the dead. These require examples may make that a little bit easier to read because both of them are actually depictions of human figures associated with tombs. Tombs, or we also use the word chulpas uh, in this particular re region of the Andes. Uh, both of them also have kind of small figures that are attached, and both of them seem to give us oh, a kind of patio or an open space within the architecture where some kind of ritual activity could take place. Uh, the one that's on the left uh, follows the pattern that I showed you earlier. You can't see the area it would be behind that we would pour in the liquid and then the liquid would be poured out right here. And we think this would have been used in libations, offerings, liquid offerings to the ancestors. And it would be your obligation, particularly if you were the male who was in authority, to provide offerings and respect to the ancestors to make sure that they were going to be on your side and help you through life. In addition to that though, and this is an important part of this, it's through the tomb that we can reinforce the lineage and the lineage is what gives you the right to the position and the status that you maintain. The object that's on our right is similar this one is located in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it too is a burial structure. Uh, and these burial structures could be multi-level or multi-floored. Uh, in this particular one, it's a pacha, and a pacha is a form of ceramic ware created in the Andes, which allows you to pour liquid in the top and out of the bottom. Now, I'm sorry I can't show you that in my slide, so you're going to have to trust me that there's a way to pour in behind, and then underneath this, there would be a spout. What that would do is allow you to pour directly into the ground to make an offering to the ancestors, perhaps to Mother Earth, but also, I think, specifically, since this depicts a tomb, to the ancestors. This is an important word, pacha, because we're going to see it again with the Inca. Another piece from Rekwai, uh, it is essentially created for the same purpose, and that would be to, at least on one level, suggest the status of the owner of this particular ceramic. It does depict an elite person. You can say a lord, and I think that would be fine. Uh, he is with his yama next to him, and that would be an indication of wealth. Uh, to have a flock of these creatures would indicate your status and wealth within the community. The uh, status of the individual also, I think, can't be missed with the gigantic ear spools and the also really enormous headdress that the in, uh, individual is wearing. He's also right here holding a staff, and pretty uniformly across cultures, the staff is a symbol of authority within the community. He is probably a little bit like the man merged with the granary, the protector of his flock, as well as the possessor of his flock. 
One of the features of requireware is that it just quite honestly tends to be uh, charming. It is delightful, almost in a kind of naive way. There's a little bit of a childishness about the style that makes it very, very endearing. And that's going to be true for the image we just saw, the man with his yama. And I think it's true for this um, double-bodied vessel, which has a little bitty mouse perched on top of it. Uh, this is located in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, so it is visible to see. It is definitely worth looking at because it's a good place to talk about the consistent elements of style of Requi. Uh, the folks here tend to use and it's not that they're the only ones, but they're the ones who tend to use it consistently and to high advantage. They use negative resist. They do use it over kaolin clay, which is local. And kaolin is white, so we're talking about a white clay. What the artist would do is apply something waxy or greasy to the surface, and that would resist the slip that was painted on. That greasy waxy material would be burned off during firing and when the pot was through the white clay underneath would be exposed. So our major colors would be white and that would be the color of the vessel, red and black. Sometimes the black paint is applied after the firing. Not always, but it can be. The um, vessel that we're looking at in the color of the kaolin right down here has another one of the diagnostic features of Requi. And this is known by a number of different names. I can't be certain of the meaning of it for the, the people of Requi, but we have come to say this about it. We kind of call it a moon monster, and it appears to be a crested. If you go over here, there's a crest that it's got. A crested feline serpent, uh, and it does usually have an elongated tail. It, by ethnographic analogy, that means what we know about other people from the region or nearby regions uh, and their beliefs, uh, this uh, creature seems to be associated uh, with water and fertility, which does, again, kind of make some sense. The image, then, is consistent in terms of stylistic elements that are associated with Requi. Requi images also consistent with traits in the North Coast uh, or the North Highlands region, the northern part of Peru, tend to embrace three-dimensional forms and a little bit more than the folks on the South do. So you can see in this case we've got our mouse. You could see last time we have a yama and a man. So there's a little bit greater love of sculptural form than of pure painted form on a reasonably flat surface. Requi does tend to blend both of those together though. Let me finish Requi with this piece. Again, it is an image that's reasonably charming to look at. It has kind of childlike qualities to it. It also conveys a narrative. There's an element of storytelling that's a part of it. I assure you, though, it meant something. In this case, our flute player almost certainly was performing as part of a ritual. Uh, this is probably not just a genre depiction, ordinary people doing ordinary things, in part because of the elaborate nature of the ceramic vessel itself. It again is one of these creations that we can pour the liquid in the back and it can come out of the spout, which is a portion of the headdress of the flute player. Uh, typical of, I'm going to call it playfulness, of the ceramic creators in the Requi culture.